Thank you, Nicole. Before I start, I just want to add a few things to, uh, to Deirdre's announcement about our meeting on November 2nd. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're going to discuss the shift we plan to make from our um, corporate meetings being on Sunday mornings to, to a weeknight. So we're going to discuss that, but there are some additional things that we'll be discussing as well. Um, uh, the, the building project, it's all kind of wrapped up into this and, and kind of, it's, it's actually kind of a perspective on the year ahead and some of the decisions that we are addressing um, and that are before us as a church. And so we, we want to do some presentation, but we, all, but we also want to get some feedback. So there'll be some time for some Q&A. And so that week we won't have any ho regular house church meetings. So Wednesday night, um, November 2nd, uh, we would encourage everybody to come. We will have it Zoomed, but obviously the Q&A time uh, will be best in getting input and feedback from people that are actually present. And so, um, the, again, like Deirdre mentioned, they'll be, we'll provide a simple meal, and then there'll be a little bit of a break before we start our time. So the details will be coming out uh, this week, but we really, if everybody could put that on their calendars. Uh, there'll be child care, so we'd like as many people uh, present as that, at that as possible. So also, as Deirdre mentioned, we are continuing our series on Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the fifth of five books of Moses, the first five books in the Bible. Uh, we have been tracing the uh, people of Israel from Egypt to the Promised Land, and they are in the second generation. The first generation was unfaithful, as we saw in the book of Numbers. They, uh, they could not believe that God had their, the best for them in mind, and so they couldn't believe that God was going to give them victory going into this promised land. And so they wanted to appoint a new leader to take them back to Egypt. And, and God, after 10 different tests that, that they had tested God with, uh, he said, you know what? Uh, you're not going to go into the land. The second generation is. And so they have been wandering around in this wilderness for 40 years, the second generation. And Moses has learned some things in what it means to lead people. The nation has learned some things. And Moses, in preparation for this second generation to go in, God has prohibited him to go in. And so he's doing all he can to prepare these people. And so he preaches this series of sermons on the edge, on, on the border. So they are on the plains of Moab. They are looking into the promised land. And he preaches this series of sermons. That's the book of Deuteronomy. It's just a series of sermons that takes place right before they're going to go into the land. He's given them some history. So he reviewed uh, mostly the negative history that Israel um, had experienced in relationship to God, reminding them of God's tremendous uh, faithfulness and victory over Egypt and the other nations uh, that they had encountered along the way. And then he had a strong encouragement, know and do the commands and teachings of God. And it starts with this command. And last week, um, I got quite a bit of feedback, actually, uh, from people. Um, it didn't seem really clear what the emphasis was, because we didn't have the passage in the, in the, um, in the reading and it seemed like I just kind of skipped. And so I really want to be emphatic here on the section that we're looking at. So Moses begins with a strong admonition to the nation of Israel that first and foremost, they have got to love God. If we don't approach our religious life from the perspective of loving God and with the foundation of loving God, all the other commands... Uh, will not be able to be fulfilled. The motivation that is sustaining, and we all know this from anything, we will do the things that we love, right? If it's not something that we love, we're not going to be able to sustain it. Guilt doesn't sustain it. Fear doesn't sustain it. The promise of rewards won't sustain it. The promise of punishment won't sustain it. Love is the sustaining, motivating factor in our walk with God, in our religious life. And so Moses has a lot of instruction then on what it means to love God. 
and how to go about it, and how, well, and how to go about loving God. And like I said um, last week, it seems strange to command our affections. And that's what, you know, love is an affection. Hope is an affection. Um, it seems strange to say that you can command affections because there's a lot of feelings wrapped up in those things. Um, but we can. The affections that we have now, when we have strong feelings for something, those things have been trained over years by the various social and cultural groups that we're in. And so Moses, in this first section in Deuteronomy, is, is telling us how to train our affections to love God. It's not unlike in that first chapter of Colossians, where, where Paul is saying, God is at work through Jesus Christ to renew us, to make us holy, blameless, and above reproach, which is unique and honorable and beautiful, all the things that we would like to be, if indeed you do not shift your hope. See, we can shift our hopes. We can put our hopes in things that take us down the path of renewal through Christ, or we can put our hopes in things that are going to appeal to our flesh. So we see throughout Scripture that our affections can be trained. And so last week, we looked at the admonition that Moses gave Israel, avoid false gods. Avoid false gods. Today, today Moses' instruction is to accept and understand God's discipline. God's discipline. And it's important for us to understand God's discipline because discipline necessarily involves pain. Discipline involves, it's, it's teaching, it's training, it's strengthening for greater capacities, greater endurance, greater faithfulness. We'll see what the reasons are here from the perspective of God. But it requires pain. And when we experience pain, there's, there's two different ways we can go when we are experiencing the, the discipline of God. And if we're not aware of how God disciplines us or why God disciplines us, um, we could get bitter. We could grow hateful towards God. We could grow resentful towards God. I thought, I thought following God was the promised land. It is, but it also requires discipline. So the experience of hardship, our experience of hardship as people of God can either lead us to bitterness and frustration and hate towards God, or it can lead to a greater love for God. That's the alternative. If we understand God's discipline, it will lead towards love. And so that's why he wants to take this section and say, you need to know what the discipline of the Lord is. He begins by saying, for these 40 years, I've led you in the whole way of me. I've led you in the whole way of the Lord. And it's an interesting phrase, because what he's saying is that the whole way of the Lord involves discipline. We would like a part of the way of the Lord, the way of the Lord that includes the, the blessing and the prosperity. Remember the promises that God gave to Abraham at the very beginning? It didn't mention anything about discipline. It was all, Abraham, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'll make your name great. I'm going to give you a big piece of land. Your descendants will outnumber the sand on the seashore. A lot of very positive things. But as, as we know the story, as Abraham went through, God began to discipline him. And the, the, the understanding of what the whole way of the Lord was grew in Abraham's mind and in his family. So one of the things that we've got to take away from this, this, this sermon, this this word out of Deuteronomy, is that the whole way of the Lord involves discipline. And discipline, as we know, is a way of teaching and training that involves pain. It involves pain. It's necessary for us to experience the promised land. Pain and suffering is necessary for us to experience the happiness and prosperity that God provides. 
And so there are three questions that Moses will answer in this text about God's discipline. The first one, why is God's discipline necessary? The second question, how does, how does God discipline us? And the third one is, what is the benefit of God's discipline? So why is it necessary? How does he do it? And what is the benefit? So the first question, why is God's discipline necessary? He says to humble us, to humble us. What does it mean to be humble? To be made low, to be made wretched. In fact, one of the definitions in the, in the Hebrew dictionary says even to be wasted away. So God is trying to, through his discipline, make us low, make us feel wretched, and make us feel like we're even wasting away. Okay, so that doesn't sound very pleasant pleasant, or, or godly. or Why would anybody want to follow a God who's going to do those things? Well, there's two reasons. He says, one, I needed to test your hearts. I needed to test your hearts. Would you remain faithful in the presence of hardship? That's what he says. I needed to know that you would, that you would keep my commandments even when things got hard. And as we know from the story, they, they didn't. The first generation didn't, and the second generation is not going to either as, as they go into the book of Joshua and then Judges. And we can be like, Lord God, there's enough pain and suffering in this world without you adding on to it. And so the text seems to indicate that that God takes specific action to humble us in order to test us to see, are we going to remain faithful even when things get hard? Because the, we, we all would recognize that whether God brings it or not, we will experience suffering and hardship in this life. So God is going to bring some into, bring some discipline into our lives uh, in order to, to prepare us. And so it, it's like, you know, when you're, when you're training for some sort of athletic event, all right, whether it's a formal thing or whether it's just a goal you have yourself or you can remember back to high school or maybe even college if you played sports, you know that you are preparing yourself for some event, okay, either games or matches or the, the end of the season playoffs or whatever it may be. You you knew that you were training for a particular event. You know, when I I swam, I played golf, I played a little football, you know, we'd have hours and hours and hours of training in either one, swimming or football or golf, for the weekly match. All right, so we, we practice around scenarios that are like the real thing so that when we get to the real thing, we're prepared. And so that's what God's discipline is. He will introduce hardship into our lives so that when real hardship comes that he doesn't bring, but the enemy may bring, or just we bring upon ourselves through our sin or whatever, we remain faithful to endure through that suffering. He's just like a coach, just like a trainer. And we all know that training for those kinds of athletic events requires pain and suffering and endurance That's also the point of fasting. We are to have fasting as some aspect or discipline in our spiritual life because it's the intentional effort to suffer so that when suffering that's outside of our control occurs in our lives, we can do something. we've, We've practiced and trained ourselves to endure. So that's the first reason why we're made humble. The second reason why we're made humble is that it helps us see our need for God. It it helps us to see that we in and of ourselves cannot hold all things together. We cannot sustain ourselves. Life brings things into our experiences that show us our weakness. And so this um, this first reason why is God's discipline necessary, it's necessary for us to see our status as human beings and that we are dependent upon God. We are dependent upon God. We need him. 
Without that, we can grow arrogant and think that we can live life without God. And that's where we see Israel will end up going. So the second question, how does God discipline us? Well, it says that he humbled us and let Israel hunger. So remember when we were going through Exodus and Numbers, we, they had a number of experiences where they, they grew thirsty, they grew hungry. And you're, you're kind of going through there, and you're like, well, why, why didn't God give them water and food before they started complaining? Obviously, God knew they needed it. Well, that, the answer to that question is here. God intentionally let them hunger. God intentionally let them thirst. He didn't cause it. He didn't cause it. He let the normal conditions of, of this world have their way. Obviously, they're in a desert. They're in a desert. Food and water are going to be hard to come by for the hundreds of thousands of people that they had. So God let normal conditions have their way. And as, again, as we saw from the story, they, num- they grumbled numerous times in the absence of food and water. And, and I think there's something else to note here in this. I think it assumes that God is always doing a lot of work to save us from possible pain. It seems like what, you know, what he does here with Israel in letting them hunger is that he, he withdrew some grace so that he would see how they were going to respond. It assumes that God is pouring forth grace at all times. It assumes that God is pouring forth grace at all times. So we saw then that God, not only does he let them hunger, he also initiated grace through manna and through clothes. It says, I gave you manna, which no one had ever heard about before. Nobody knew anything about it. So I gave you heavenly food so that you could see that it was me providing it. It wasn't cattle, it wasn't goats, it wasn't fruit, it was something supernatural. And their clothes didn't wear out for 40 years. I've got a shirt in my drawer that I got in 2008 when I volunteered for the Uptown Art Fair. I still use it as a work shirt. So that's, you know, that's a while, but they are really on their last threads. 10 or 15 years, maybe we can get out of some clothes, and that sounds like a long time. 40 years? No clothes, no shoes. That's a supernatural thing that God did. Supernatural food, supernatural clothing. (laughs) I'd love a pair of boots that lasted 40 years. That'd be great. So God lets them. So he uses the normal conditions of life. They're in a desert. It's not going to have a lot of food or water. He let that natural condition bring them to a point of humility, and he initiated some things that they were completely not expecting to show them that, hey, God is the source of of life and sustenance. This is what God does. And again, I want to go back to this point. If If we could look out into our experience and believe that God is always active in providing for us. That God is always active in providing for us. Rather than, I think this is typically what we do, at least I should say that I do. I don't see the presence of God or I don't acknowledge the presence of God until I am suffering. And and then I'm like, why isn't God doing something here and now has God forgotten about me I think that's our typical perspective when we suffer we automatically think that God is not doing anything when in, I think the facts show what the text is saying and if we believe that Jesus is sustaining all things then anything that we experience in life that is sustaining is an act of God's grace through Jesus Christ 
it seems here that when we don't have, it's, 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 it's God making an effort to teach us and to show us that he's always present. He's always present. He's always sustaining. He's always extending grace to us. The third question, what is the benefit of God's discipline? Literally, to take Israel into the promised land, to experience that whole list of things in a very detailed way that, that the passage states. The promised land. God's promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Israel. God's promise from Genesis through Revelation. You see it abundantly in the wisdom literature. You see it out of Jesus' own mouth. I have come to give you abundant life. I have come. The man, the man or woman who meditates on the law day and night is like a tree uh, firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season. Prosperity, happiness, blessing. That's the, the biblical term blessing is the term happiness. The promise of God for his people is prosperity and happiness. That is what God is wanting to bring us into the discipline is there so that we can experience prosperity and happiness in his presence as a result of his blessing, in the fullness of who he is. But we have to deal with the, the reality of a, of a world that is corrupt, of a world that is under the influence of the devil, literally, um, and of our own flesh. Evil exists in the world. False gods exist in the world, like we saw last week. False gods that we ourselves make up, our culture makes up, the enemy makes up. False gods exist. Exist. Evil exists. Our tendency is to let our hearts slide towards the flesh and these temptations and these false gods, which is why we saw last week that we need new hearts. And the scriptures teach that Jesus Christ gives us new hearts. He regenerates us, makes us a new creation. All right, but just because we get new hearts doesn't mean we can check out of the training of those hearts. Our new hearts need training. Training involves discipline. And just like you know, when an athlete wins the race, they don't look back at all on, the, on all the pain and all the time and all the suffering that they had to endure in order to get to that point of having won the race. And the Bible also uses another analogy of a, of a, of a, of a mother who has just given birth to a baby but has endured months of suffering and pain and then the labor pains, but once that baby has come, all of that is forgotten. The baby has come. And so God is disciplining us to experience what we long for, prosperity and happiness. And we, it just takes the work and the discipline to get there. So it's in obedience that we learn through training. Right? Remember, because it's, it's, are we going to do the right thing even when things get hard? In obedience, we experience God's blessing. I think I said last week, um, faith and then obedience and then feelings. Oftentimes we start with feelings and we make decisions around feelings um, and then expect that those feelings continue and we want God to bless us. It's faith, obedience, then feelings. Deirdre said I, that's a simplistic way to approach it. I, I understand that, but it... it um, there's a lot of other things involved, but, but we have to go towards God first and foremost in faith. And in that faith, we, we follow him and follow his purposes. Uh, this reality of experiencing blessing as a consequence or that suffering comes along with blessing and happiness is even recognized by a secular psychologist and sociologist. Paul Bloom is an author, he's a psychologist, uh, fairly well known. He says, 
in his analysis and in his understanding of people and all of his, you know, his research and in his clinical studies, says a life well lived is more than a life of pleasure. It involves, among other things, moral goodness and meaningful pursuits. Okay, a vision and direction for life that's characterized by moral goodness. And some forms of suffering involving struggle and difficulty are essential parts of achieving these higher goals and for living a complete and fulfilling life. So even the secular world recognizes that if we just pursue pleasure, prosperity, and happiness and avoid any form of suffering, we're not going to achieve what we want. So if, if this is true, if, the, if, if what is if, if, if what we are seeing in, this, in the Bible is true, and if even that truth is, is established and affirmed by the secular world, we have to come away from our understanding of God. We have to form an understanding of his whole way of working with us and recognize that if God is going to take us through discipline, then God must really love us. That God must really love us. And that our struggle against evil is necessary. The pain we experience in that struggle is necessary. It is a good thing. The struggle, the pain, is a good thing. It is God's way of bringing into our lives true prosperity and happiness that we'll experience. And Jesus wasn't even exempt from this. Jesus was not spared the discipline of God. The book of Hebrews says this, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. To me, that's mind-blowing. Jesus learned obedience through suffering. So that's got to be our path. If it was the path for Jesus, it's got to be our path. It's part of the whole way of God in, in forming us as people to experience his promises. Rather than grumble and turn to false gods, Jesus cried out to God. Rather than being bitter and angry, towards God and wanting another leader like the nation of Israel did, Jesus held on to God as his leader and cried out for help in the midst of his pain and suffering to save him from death. Jesus knew that the path before him led to death. We know that Jesus died, but we also know that God saved his son from death by raising him from the dead. And then the Bible teaches that that same power that Jesus had from the Holy Spirit through which he raised from the dead is the same power that lives in us. And one of the prayers that you see throughout Scripture is that we would grasp a sense of that power and cry out to God asking him for help in the moment of our suffering, in the moment where we're humbled, in the moment where we're feeling wasted away, where we're feeling wretched, Do we cry out to God to ask him to help? Help God save me from this suffering. Or do we retreat to false gods for the quick pleasures of this world to ease and comfort us? The whole way of God involves pain. Jesus led the way and gave an example. Cry out to God in the midst of suffering for help. And then through a variety of ways... God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Who knows how he's going to answer prayer? Sometimes our suffering lasts a long time. We have some some members of our church family that are experiencing suffering that's lasted not days, not weeks, not months, but years. And sometimes the suffering we experience may even be a lifetime. But God, through his Holy Spirit, will provide a way for us to endure. In fact, 
Paul's definition of deliverance is that we would endure the suffering with joy and in honoring Christ, which means that we endure without resorting to false gods. We endure without giving in to the sinful temptations. And again, the gospel is that that same power is in us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that delivers from death has been given to us. And so that's the promise that we can endure. Now, if we get the perspective that, well, then we should be able to be perfect, we've taken it to the extreme. There's no promise of perfection. Paul said that even himself. We live with that daily struggle, and there will be moments when we aren't faithful. There will be moments where we don't endure. And in those moments of humility, of of feeling not only wretched from the suffering, but also the guilt and shame of having sin, we still cling to God. Because the gospel is that we exist in a sphere of grace. We stand in a, a, in a sphere of grace. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit that can never be taken away from us. So even in the suffering that we experience due to our own sin, we still cry out to God because that's, that's the gospel. And God still delivers. God still delivers. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you for uh, this word. Thank you for teaching us and and training us in uh, what it means for you to discipline us. Um, It's it's incredible. Uh, God, we we resist it. Even when we know these things, Lord, we resist it because we're just so... um, We just want to experience happiness. We want to experience prosperity. God, you have put that desire in us as, as, as men and women made in your image. But the struggle against pain and sin and and evil, Lord God, is, is hard. So again, we ask for your strength to endure it and to persevere even when we fail. In Jesus' name, amen.